Meine Damen och Herr, Jag beklager att jag varken taler eller förstår svenska. Så jag ber er ersätta mig när jag försätter min förläsning på engelsk. See this thing. How does this work? <laughs> push it here. Oh yes. Okay. And it points where? Hi. Okay. Um, so I must uh, first say how uh, wonderful it is to know that the uh, Nobel Committee recognizes that basic research in Drosophila can, uh, as we say, pay off, uh, and. Uh, I want to divide my talk today. Oh, I also want to say how nice it is that it allows me to bring my family here again to Sweden. At least my wife and I have been here several times. Uh, and we're going to Uppsala, and we're going to spend two days in, Ups in, in Umeå with the Rasmussens and their family. Uh, so my, my talk today will be in three parts. The title was first 50 years of the bithorax complex. So the first part of the talk will be the first 40 years. Then I will show a video of a movie we've made over the years with many parts. And this uh, then uh, will be followed by the last 10 years of the 50 years. And the future I leave to you. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, I want to give a little history uh, of the subject especially to bring up the fact that, that the first Nobel Prize in Drosophila genetics was, as you know, given to Thomas Hunt Morgan for discovering the white eye in 1910. But another milestone was in 1915, just 80 years ago, when Bridges found the first bithorax mutant, the first homeotic mutant. Uh, homeosis being a term Bateson had de defined for these transformation of antennae into legs in, in various insects that had been seen in museums. But, but this was the first genetic mutant that did, uh, did this type of transformation, and we'll see lots of examples of that. And then 1925 was when Sturdivant uh, worked out, among many other things, he had discovered the linear order of genes when he, was in high, when he was a sophomore in college. But he was able to show genetically that there are tandem duplications of genes in the chromosome that it would explain a famous mutant, the barfly. Uh, he did the genetics of that. In another 10 years, Bridges was able to do the salivary gland chromosome analysis of bar and found it was a tandem duplication. And we're going to have a lot to say about that as a mode of evolution that uh, has finally been verified for this particular group of genes we call the bithorax complex in, uh, in the uh, uh, 1946. I, I put that date down for, it was January, so it's about 50 years ago. That was why the title has 50 years in it. In the last 10 years, a great discovery was the homeobox by Walter Gehring and his group, and uh, Matt Scott independently discovered the homeobox, making use of a protein sequence that had been figured out for the ultra-bithorax, one of the alleles of bithorax, and uh, antennapedia. So with that uh, historical background, we won't need that, I think, I want to go on with the first slide, which will be of Thomas Hunt Morgan looking at the flies. Uh, he didn't like to have his picture taken, and so Bridges had a camera hidden over here, and uh, they all shook the bottles, I'm told. Sturdivant told me that, and so he got his picture nicely taken. The next slide will show Bridges. I didn't know him. He had died when I came to Caltech in 39. He died in 38 and accomplished a tremendous amount of, of uh, detail, it, not only in mapping the chromosomes, but in keeping the flies in these stocks. And we've all benefited greatly because of his uh, foresight in keeping mutations, his 
brilliant uh, ability to detect very slight abnormalities, map them, save the stock, and balance the stock in a, such a way that it would be pure breeding. And we still have this cold room uh, collection that is shown here. We replace the wood with metal, and we, the bars are for, so the bottles don't fall off during our frequent earthquakes. <laughs> the, um, so the next slide shows Sturdivant, who was the uh, founder of many of the principles of modern genetics, and I had the privilege of working with him and, and uh, learned much about not only Drosophila, but the speciation and many other aspects. And I'd like to say that in the December issue of Genetics, which perhaps hasn't reached Sweden yet, there is an essay called Remembering Sturdivant, which I tried to cover all the science, plus mainly the personal aspects of his life and how it was that we interact, could it, as graduate students, work with him. Uh, now, the next slide, we'll get into some of the science. Uh, it was predicted by Bridges, actually, that these double-banded structures in the giant chromosomes would be tandem duplications of genes. It's still, I was talking to Dr. Uh, Danaholt last night, it's still not quite clear that this is, that these are artifacts or whether they are, in fact, duplicate genes. But it was an interesting example that we could try to test the hypothesis that the bithorax mutant and several others that Bridges had found that were called members of a single gene uh, series or alleles uh, were, in fact, separable by recombination into a gene cluster. So this is the current status. We took bithorax and recombined it with BXD by thoraxoid, which Bridges found. And then there was a mutant in between that was thought to be allelic. To make a long story short, we early discovered that this was a group of genes, or regulatory regions as we now call some of them, that were located. And we were able to show they were located in these four bands. So we were very triumphant. We have proved the hypothesis that they were tandem duplica duplications of genes, because they corresponded with the four bands. This is probably not correct but it nevertheless inspired us, inspired us to keep going. And uh, the next, uh, let me just point out that this is the current status of that cluster. At only a few regions, such as UBX, a region in here and a region in this out here, make proteins. The top figure of, of the figure is the number of kilobases of DNA that make up this complex. Now we have the entire complex sequence by a group at Berkeley who have found that there are some 315,000 DNA base pairs in this small region located here. That's that group of, uh, of DNA, uh, DNA bases is responsible for all of those muta mutational effects. The lower line are so-called loss of function mutants, many of which I show in the video. The upper one are dominant gain of function mutants, which are quite remarkable and are widely used now in mammals as a way of studying some of the genes that we're talking about in mammals, because the loss of function mutations in mammals are more difficult to fo follow because they, we, we have a redundancy of a fourfold repetition of this set of, of genes in, in our chromosomes. Uh, the next slide will show the current status now of, of the, uh, just, this is just an introduction to point out that not only does the fly have a nice set of segments that are linearly arranged, T1, 2, 3 are the thoracic, and these eight abdominal segments, ventrally shown, have a corresponding set of cuticular structures in the larva, and we'll see that in the video carried forth. The next slide will show the, the more uh, the actual the actual uh, appearance of these animals. Uh, this was really a breakthrough when we found out you didn't have to section these animals to learn something about the embryology because just about the time the egg is ready to hatch, you can see all this detail that would be present in the first instar larva or even the late embryo. 
So they have special abdominal cetal, cetal belts to crawl on and so on. The important thing about this slide is this would be a wild type embryo at the late, at just before hatching, and this would be one in which we were able to delete all of the genes. When that happens, it's not evident from this figure because the thoracic segments here have virtually no CT developed, so the, it looks bare throughout the animal. But in a remarkable mutant called polycomb, which my wife found many years ago, that mutation has all of the segments converted into the eighth abdominal. And the interpretation now is that that mutant plus a, a family of such mutants that now is known to exist is capable of turning all of the genes on of the bithorax cluster that you just saw, uh, probably in all of the segments. And in this case, none of the genes are on in any of the segments. Uh, so uh, the, the next slide will bring, I think, us up to the current status of the map of the <coughs> bithorax complex, as we call it, in terms of its function along the axis of the fly. And there's a principle we call the collinear effect, in which the bithorax mutants begin working here. And there's a series of them, and they actually continually uh, turn on in an order co coincident with the order of the segment, so that this BXD and PBX turn on in the posterior part of the segment. This turns on in the anterior part. And then there are some abdominal genes that are of two groups. One we call the abdominal A domain here, and this is called the abdominal B domain. And you'll notice that these are the protein coding regions. And the astonishing thing is that there is only about 2% a little less than 2% of this immense piece of 315,000 bases that are actually coding for uh, protein. The black bars then are the coding parts and these are the introns. All of the rest is concerned with regulatory regions which we call in the, this case infra-abdominal because these represent loss of function mutations that we have that re bring about those effects. Uh, so we will move on now to the next slide. And uh, we're ready for the video. Sorry. Can we turn the video on now? Life cycle starts with two eggs which mounted and photographed in mineral oil. The egg develops into a first-thing star larva in about one day at room temperature. Actually, the egg on the left has a first-thing star larva struggling to emerge. About five days later, we see a mature third instar larva. Notice the black jaw hook used to burrow into the food and the posterior spiracle used for breathing. On the right is a just pupated third instar larva. In the pupa on the left and in those in the next sequence, adult tissues gradually replace larval tissues until eyes and wing pads become clearly visible. Nine days after egg hatching, the adult emerges from the pupa case, and in less than an hour, the wings have expanded, as in this adult male. Note legs on the first, second, and third segments of the thorax, with the sex comb on the first leg. Dorsally, only the second segment is well developed, the first and third being all but absent, except for tiny halteries, which replace the second pair of wings of other winged insects. Note the six abdominal segments, the last two being solid black in the male. In this adult female, the fifth and sixth abdominal segments lack the solid black pigmentation we saw in the male. As this sequence ends, life cycle starts over again. We will see first a largely undifferentiated worm-like stage, which will acquire a head segment and finally tiny CT on all of the abdominal segments, which will result in the annelids, such as the earthworm. Next, antennae and tiny pseudolegs produce the onychophorans, animals that may be the missing link between annelids and arthropods. True legs then formed on most of the body segments, including the head, produce the trilobites, whose only living fossil is the horseshoe crab. Next, we will see legs on the head segments turning into mandibles to produce the millipedes or centipedes. Legs gradually disappeared from the abdominal segments, leaving a hypothetical eight-legged ancestor. And finally, a six-legged insect, such as the bison urine, 
or silverfish. Later, we had insects evolve, the first of which probably had three pairs of wings, as in this rare fossil Nematocoran. Insects evolved as the wings on the first Jurassic segment were suppressed. The earliest flying insects probably had virtually identical wings on the second and third Jurassic segments, as in the Macopterans, or the present-day stoneflies. We next see a true fly, or dipteran. The halteries replace the second pair of wings. The proboscis replaces the mandibles, and in some, the arista replaces the antenna. Also, in the higher diptera, such as Drosophila, the eyes have greatly enlarged and the wing venation is considerably reduced. Loss of function mutants of the Bithorax complex will be illustrated by showing living flies. The first, having a double mutant combination of Bithorax and post Bithorax that results in a four winged fly. We thought this was the best transformation of the third Jurassic segment into the second that could be achieved. This male four-winged fly is walking on a glass slide. He has just recovered from being etherized, and so he's a little unsteady. Notice that the third Jurassic segment now resembles the second, but the wings in the thorax are significantly smaller than the second segment. We then discovered that we could make a much improved four-winged fly by adding the antero bithorax mutant to the double mutant combination. Notice that this four-winged winged female now has a third Jurassic segment transformed into a virtually exact replica of the second. Note especially the identity of the wing vein patterns and also of the hair and bristle patterns of the two thoraxes. The female falls off the edge of the glass slide and lands upside down. We see again how similar are the wing veins between the two segments. Here is a male four-winged fly that has the same triple mutant genotype as the female we just saw. This genotype is remarkably constant in its expression, even though it re represents only a partial loss of function of the ultrabithorax domain of the bithorax complex. The widespread belief that all homeotic mutants are highly variable in their expression is simply incorrect. The next mutant is Bithoraxor, which has the first abdominal segment partially transformed into a thoracic segment. This fly has been glued to a glass slide. Notice how the fourth pair of legs is capable of moving. In some animals that have only one dose of the Bithoraxor mutant, as in this laterally mounted female, a partially wing-like abdominal halter arises on the first abdominal segment. The first gain of function mutant found in the bithorax complex was contrabithorax. It is a dominant X-ray induced mutation which results in the second thoracic segment transforming toward the third. Just the opposite the loss of function mutants that we have just seen. Notice how halteries replace the second pair of wings in this male that is homozygous for the contrabithorax mutant. This will become clearer at a higher magnification where the halteries of the second thoracic segment approach those of the third and the thorax proper begins to be greatly reduced. Notice this is especially true of the left side of this contrabithorax male. The next gain of function mutant is hyperabdominal, in which T3 transforms to A2. The result is a four legged fly. This hyperabdominal mutation has been shown by others involve a single base pair change in a binding site for the hunchback protein, a trans repressor of one of the genes of the complex. The expression is highly variable so that only a few animals have four legs and no halteries, as in this fly in which the wings have been cut off. At the higher magnification it is evident that there are no halteries as well as no T3 legs.
Miscadastral pigmentation is the third gene of function mutant in which A4 transforms toward A5. The MCP male is the middle fly. Note that A4 as well as A5 and A6 is solidly pigmented black. On the left is a wild type male with a typical black pigmentation of A5 and A6. We will not discuss the male on the right, except to say that it is a double mutant composed of MCP and another gene of function mutant, super abdominal, that was induced with X-rays on an MCP chromosome. A3 is also now black, as are A4, A5, and A6. By late effects, we mean the adult phenotypes. We start by showing a diagram of the wild-type adult male. This is followed by an interpretation of how the mutants produce the various phenotypes, starting with the loss of function type of mutant. Again, we see the four-winged fly genotype that involves a partial loss of function of three regulatory regions, ABX, CX, and PDX. As a result, C3 transforms toward C2, which we diagram here as a T2-like wing on T3. Now we will consider again the bithyraxoid mutant. The diagram of the bithyraxoid fly shows the partial conversion of C3 toward C2 and the partial conversion of A1 toward C2. To explain this, we show the wild type BXC in the lower right part of the diagram is partially turned off in C3 and in A1. Now we will consider an intra-abdominal 5 phenotype, which is a transformation of A5 and A6 toward A4. The first such mutant was IB5C7. The interpretation is that the wild type IB5 region, IB5+, is turned off in A5 and A6 as a result of the C7 mutant. Now we will see again the first gain of function phenotype, contrabithorax. It involves a turning on of ultrabithorax, UBX+, plus, in T2 as well as in T3. The result is the wings turn into halteries. Not shown here is a reduction in the dorsal thorax of T2 as it converts to dorsal T3. As we saw, hyperabdominal is the gain of function mutant that transforms T3 toward A2. It involves a turning on of the IB2 function, IB2 plus, in T3 and A1, whereas it normally turns on in A2. The result is a fly with only four legs and no halteries. We have already seen that the MCP mutant transforms A4 to A5. It involves a turning on of the IB5 function, IB5+, plus, in A4 as well as in A5. The result is that not only A5 and A6 are black, but so is A4. We will now return to a diagram of the wild-type male in which the successive turning on of the BXD, the IB2, and the IB5 regions can account for the patterning of adult abdominal segments. Now, to explain why there is no leg on A1, the BXD plus function is shown as turned on in A1, but off in T3. To explain why A2 differs slightly from A1, IB2 plus function is shown as on in A2, but off in A1. Finally, to explain why A4 is not solid black, IB5 plus function is shown as on in A5, but off in A4. By early effects, we mean those that can be seen in the cuticle and spiracles of a late embryo. Starting with the undifferentiated worm, the wild-type embryo is constructed by showing a yellow head segment, three light orange thoracic segments, and eight dark orange abdominal segments, and by showing other structures that we will describe. For identification purposes, the thoracic and abdominal segments are then numbered. The diagram next shows a late embryo that lacks the entire bithorax complex owing to a deficiency called BFC9. The cuticle and the tracheal system have reverted to a primitive state. Here we start with the tracheal system. 
infinitive insects, each segment starting with two teeth, has a separate tracheal opening or spiracle. But in the wild-type embryo, they are connected to form the dorsal tracheal trunks that terminate in the posterior spiracle. The ventral tips are tiny sense organs, normally found only in the thoracic segment. And the chylon organs are a trio of hairs that are the last vestiges of the thoracic legs. The ventral bands of CT are used in crawling. The chitinized plates are portions of the jaw hook, normally located in the head region. The deficient CT9 embryo is diagrammed again. In order to deduce the function of the major regulatory regions of the bithorax complex, special genotypes were constructed. We added to the deficiency T9 genotype a duplication called du duplication 100 that contributes only the UBX plus domain of the complex, except that the BXD portion of the domain is inactivated. Such embryos have the dorsal tracheal trunks restored. Thus, UBX plus alone is able to connect up the tracheal trunks in all segments from T3 to A8. We next added duplication T10 to deficiency T9. This genotype has all of the UBX plus domain, including BXD plus. We now see that BXD plus has three functions. It carries out from A1 to A8. BXD plus suppresses the ventral tips, partially suppresses the chylon organs, and partially develops the ventral single band. A third genotype, deficiency C4, leaves only the wild type UBX, BXD, and IB2 regions. We can infer that IAB2 plus completes development of the ventral pseudo band from A2 to A8 and completes the suppression of the chylon organs. Finally, another deficiency, deficiency 109, deletes all of the bithorax complex except for the distal wild type region containing IAB8 plus. We infer that the function of IAB8 plus is to suppress the chitinized plate and to cause the posterior spiracles to form. To summarize, in the wild-type embryo, two rules are evident. Once a region becomes expressed, it stays expressed in more posterior regions. Secondly, the order in which the regions become expressed parallels their order in the chromosome. Polycomb is a mutant that causes all segments commencing with C2 to develop posterior spiracles and ventral cetal bands like those of A8. It was found by my wife, and I call it the better half of bithorax. The wild-type polycomb gene thus acts as a repressor of the bithorax complex, and it is now known to be one of a family of such repressor genes. We now propose a model to explain how the various regions of the bithorax complex are expressed in the embryo. We assume that once the expression is set up by upstream genes, it is maintained by a gradient in the concentration of the repressor protein, shown in black. The gradient of repressor protein in the wild-type embryo is shown as a steadily diminishing concentration until A8 is devoid of protein. We show again the embryonic wild-type pattern and focus first on segments T2 and T3. We're going to see those next enlarged. Note first the state of the spiracle and cuticular structures which we have seen are under the control of the bithorax complex. We see a cell appear in each of these segments. The nucleus will gradually enlarge until we can make out the relevant regions of the bithorax complex. Note that the nuclear sap contains the repressor proteins, shown as black dots. Notice also that the bithorax regions have a steadily increasing affinity for the repressor molecules that starts with UBX plus and is represented by an increasing number of booklets under each region. Soon the proteins will start to move to the chromosome and bind to the booklets, with the one exception that in T3 but not T2, the affinity of UBX plus is so weak that none of the protein binds. The repressed regions then are blacked out, leaving only UBX plus active in T3. Now the UBX product shown as a green circle leaves the complex and carries out its function of restoring the tracheal trunk. Proceed now to segments T3 and A1. 
There will then be a repetition of much of the sequence that you have just seen until we arrive at the enlarged nucleus where the concentration of repressor molecules has continued to decrease so that UBX plus becomes activated in A1 as well as in T3. The UBX product will repeat its journey and restore the tracheal trunks in both segments. Actually, the UBX product is known to be a homeodomain protein. It therefore returns to the nucleus and binds to other genes, one or more of which are expected to carry out the actual restoration of the tracheal trunks. We do not know the exact order in which the genes come on within a given segment, but for simplicity, we assume that the BXD plus product, shown here as a blue and red circle, next leaves the complex in A1, but not in T3, because of the lower concentration of repressor in A1. It first puts a partially developed ventral seal band on A1, followed by a partial suppression of the chylin organs and a complete suppression of the ventral pits. We proceed now to segments A1 and A2. Again, there will be a repetition of the sequence just seen until we arrive at the enlarged nucleus. The concentration of repressor molecules has continued to decrease so that BXD plus as well as UBX plus becomes activated in A2 as well as in A1. The UBX plus product is shown as having already completed the restoration of the tracheal trunks in both segments. The BXD plus function is then repeated in A2 and of course in A1 as well. When the BXD plus functions are completed, the IAB2 plus product, shown as a blue and purple circle, becomes activated in A2 but not in A1 and begins its journey. Next, we consider A2 and A8 omitting the segments in between, since in the embryo the differences between them and A2 are very slight. As the enlarged nucleus appears, it is evident that the concentration of repressor molecules has continued to decrease and effectively become zero in A8. The UBX plus and the BXD plus product are now shown as having already completed their functions. The IB2 plus product becomes activated in both segments and repeats its journey in A8 as well as in A2. Finally, the IAB8 plus product, shown as a brown and yellow circle, becomes activated in A8 and begins its journey, first forming the pair of posterior spiracles. Finally, it suppresses the chitinized plates completely. This completes our interpretation of the role of the bithorax complex in controlling the patterning of the embryonic segments. Here's the wild type embryo again. We hope our model is correct in broad outline, even though in detail it may need lots of improvement. <coughs> mm.
we could have, have the next slide, please. Uh, this slide will help me introduce the next two speakers who will be telling you about how we get down to the stage I've been talking about. They've been working on the genes that control the polarity of the egg and uh, setting up the basic segmentation pattern and so on. Down here I want to point out Again, the principle that we said was collinearity. In this case, the protein of, a, of, the, of the other half of the, of the homeotic complex, the antennapedia complex, is shown as turning on in T2 and uh, somewhat diminishing in the other segments. Ultrabithorax protein turns on in T3 to accomplish the effects that you've been seeing in the adult and the embryo. This IAB2 is the term we've used, used to use for the protein that was the abdominal A protein and the new terminology that Inez Moretta, Morata invented. The next slide will show uh, Welcome Bender, who has been a collaborator for a long time with us, and it's a very precise patterning of the cuticular organs that you have been seeing. <laughs> the, uh, we, we often have Halloween parties uh, in our Drosophila groups, and this was, was one of them that has quite instructive value as well, as you can see. The next slide shows, it's to introduce a remarkable demonstration by, Walter, by, by Welcome Bender of the principle of collinearity of the UBX protein, which is being stained here with an antibody, and it stains blue in this particular case. It doesn't agree with our uh, animation colors, uh, but it's hard to make colors that agree with those. At any rate, this antibody shows that up in the front end of the animal, which is this end of the embryo, he cuts the embryo down the middle and splays it out in this fashion. So this would be the left and the right half. And these are the various segments starting with the T3. And you notice it can, the protein continues to stay on in certain cells. The brown is the ABDA protein, or what I've called IAB2 uh, gene product, uh, and that is... Come, is, is absent in, up in the T3 area, but begins to turn on in A1 and A2. I won't go into the uh, fact that the segments are, are really Paris segments in the terminology of Peter Lawrence. We don't need that uh, specifically for this uh, uh, demonstration here, and it's difficult to, to define the front. This would be the frontal boundary of, of each of these in, in Paris segments. Now, the next slide will show the continuation of that so-called collinearity rule for additional proteins. Here would be the ABDA protein, and I bring this part in. ABDB proteins are ones being studied extensively by Dr. Sue Selnicker in our lab, and she's found uh, that there are two forms of the protein, and they also are uh, collinear in their production. We don't have antibodies that would allow us to study all of those simultaneously, unfortunately, but we believe that once on, they tend to stay on, that there may be exceptions to that in, in s several cases, including the antennapedia complex as well. Now, I, I want to mention one more mutant that we couldn't... Uh, next slide, please. We couldn't show this very well uh, in the film. Uh, the more recent films that were pro being produced for television are no good for this kind of purpose, and they stopped making the, the film that gave us our best pictures many years ago. This is a, an amazing mutation. This is a normal m male over here. There's a sex comb there. This is a mutation that causes the ABDB protein to be generated in the males as if it were uh, being generated in the abdomen. And what has happened here is a new kind of... Uh, of mutation in which a regulatory region for genes that are producing the muscle attachment points, and they are these points in the fly, has been coupled by a little inversion with the ABDB protein region, and this amazing mutation is, has, a, as a result, a regulatory region of another gene driving the expression of this protein in this peculiar place. But the remarkable thing is it produces a sexually dimorphic transformation of the thoraces of this fly. We've published this work in the Genes and Development, but I stress it merely as an example of a new understanding that comes out of, of the 
realization that in addition to protein coding regions, there are these immense regions that regulate where and when the proteins are going to be made. And uh, the uh, next development would be the discovery of the homeobox. If we could go on now to the discoverers. Uh, next uh, slide. Oh, let me just say the, the interpretation. Sorry. If you back up, go ahead once. Uh, I meant to give the interpretation of this. Could we have the next slide? Yes. Sir. Now, the interpretation is that that protein is being turned on, the ABDB protein is being turned on. In this case, this is the wing disc that has the thoracic part, and there's one-to-one -one correspondence between those pigmented black areas and the actual muscle attachment points for the, for the muscles of the wing. The next slide should show you the one after that. We'll show you the um, co-discoverers of the homeobox, Walter Gehring and his group with M uh, M Bill McGinnis and several other authors all collaborated to discover this remarkable sequence that's common to all of the homeobox, all of the genes of the bithorax complex and antennapedia complex, 180 base pairs coding for 60 amino acids, that, that a region of the protein that binds to DNA. And this is Matt Scott, uh, now at Stanford University. Gehring is, of course, at Basel. And this is the discovery that has opened up the, the, our analysis of the fruit fly uh, into uh, all organisms, commencing as we saw and heard in Ascona from the lowest coral to the, uh, to the highest vertebrate, if you want to call human beings the highest vertebrate. Uh, so uh, the, the cluster then, let's uh, just summarize the next slide. The bithorax cluster of the fly is shown here. It's shown opposite because it's shown in the direction in which it's transcribed. So this would be the rear end of the fly and the head end up here. Uh, in Drosophila, it, the complex is broken uh, between these, which uh, really set us back many, many years. But in vertebrates, starting with the fish, uh, there is a continuous sequence of these uh, so that the complex... Uh, for some reason, uh, is so necessary that it be in this order that it is not broken up, we estimate, except in Drosophila, in 500 million years. It's estimated to be over 500 million years old, this complex. I put down here a hemoglobin gene cluster, which obeys somewhat the same rules of collinearity in the sense that you start with embryonic, fetal, and adult hemoglobins, but that's a relatively recent cluster. These are extremely ancient, possibly the most ancient set of genes known, although I think uh, it's possible that some of the olfactory gene clusters, if they should turn out to be linked like this, might, might antedate even this, but I like to think this is the oldest gene cluster we have. Um, the next slide shows the mouse and the, and the Drosophila compa compared. These are studies where you can use the RNA or, or in some case, protein to show the boundaries. It, it doesn't show that there is probably continuous expression all the way back of these. That's difficult to show, and it's not always uh, the case. But there is a remarkable parallel between the mouse and the fly in having a, the same type of homeobox-containing protein genes. And, uh, and uh, the... Um, correlation for collinear expression along the body axis. And what is not shown here is that there are four sets of these. There are four different chromosomes. And that duplication, a fourfold duplication, makes it extremely difficult to analyze the complexes. As you know, uh, uh, Mario Capecchi is doing remarkable work with the mouse by deleting these genes. But in general, it's better to have a gain-of-function mutant to see an effect when there's so much redundancy, and that's one of the um, prime ways of studying these genes. The next slide will show the, our particular group. This is uh, Matt, David Matog who's doing the computer analysis of the sequence. Dr. Sue Selnicker is doing the, genetics, uh, the, the molecular genetics of this complex. <coughs> and uh, we have uh, one of our research assistants helping with both the molecular and the computing analysis, John Knopfels, 
And this faded figure here is, is, is evidently the person standing here. Uh, the, uh, so I just wanted to, to try to summarize by saying that we started this basic research uh, 50 years ago, and we were concerned with how do new genes arise from old genes. We were not considering how development occurs. We, we thought it was impossible to study development at that time. Don Poulsen was sectioning, had just sectioned Drosophila eggs of the Notch mutant, and it seemed hopeless. But there was a big breakthrough when we finally found that you could look at the cuticle and begin to see the effects of our mutants. And so the more we studied that gene cluster, the more interesting it became from a developmental standpoint. And then, as I said, about 10 or 11 years ago, the discovery of the homeobox shows that this is an ancient set of genes that uh, is estimated, as I said, to be over 500 million years old. And it is clearly uh, one that is, could we have the lights, please? Uh, it is clearly one that is going to tell us much about, we, we uh, trust, uh, such questions as uh, how do birth defects arise. We even believe that some of these mut mutations will have important effects that will lead to cancers. Uh, or tumors, at least. And uh, so we've had our work recognized then that, that you can, you can uh, study how new genes arise, and you just suddenly discover that you have learned something about how not only flies but human beings develop, how these genes control them. And in turn, you find out that you have a new probe by which you can study using these homeobox genes the evolution of all organisms, all animal organisms, starting, as I said, in Ascona, we heard from the corals on up. So that is where we are present, and in the future, we, we hope that uh, other young people will continue uh, where we left off.